I'm really glad today uh, to introduce to you an old over here, Levinson. He, he's a homegrown material. So he was here uh, when I came, you're already here. So <laughs> I just remember you abandoning me in 1993. Yeah. But I was uh, I was telling other people, Anodo is not my friend. <laughs> Anne is my friend. It's <laughs> why <laughs> because she was the person who gave me word perfect word form. But then there was word perfect and the word, and word perfect was better than word, but didn't have that much money like words. So that's why I like Anne and Anodo. So Anodo got his uh, bachelor's in oceanology from Univers. I'm gonna mess up this, this up. Univers Dutch Autonoma de Bayer, California, Mexico. 1988 got a master's. Guess what? Like maybe it should have been in Swahili. <laughs> uh, in in 1988, he got a master's from this place. By like then, it was. Uh, MSRC, and uh, in 1992, he got his PhD from here again, uh, and his advisor was uh, Bob, Bob Bruce. Okay. And so he, he went straight to Old Dominion and uh, invited me to play on the James River. We did a lot of work there. And, all of the chess pieces. And uh, he, he, um, in 2001, he became associate professor. Then uh, in 2005, he moved to the University of Florida. And uh, from 2008, he's been the professor to this day there. And he's currently finishing his term as a a rotator program officer at the National Science Foundation. And one other little bit, he's written very few papers, only 230. <laughs> so keep on doing the work. We're expecting a little bit more. And without further ado, I want to invite an order on this topic because him and I have discussed it, they've argued, they agreed. This morning we we are agreeing on a few things, but I'm looking for something I can argue against. It's about the moon, how the moon and the sun can cause other things to move around the ocean. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Kamasima. I'm, I'm delighted to be here for two reasons, because I'm material, as Kamasima said from this place. <laughs> and second, because I see my former advisor, Bob Wilson, here. Uh, so thank you for coming, Bob. I hope, hope that we can have some of that. Well, and also to see uh, the people who were professors already here when I was a student. So thank you, everybody, for, for being here. And as you see there on the screen, the, the main message of this talk will be that whenever we study the ocean, whatever we're studying, that we shouldn't forget about the, the sun and the moon and the potential influences of them on what we're studying. So that's the main the main message, right? It's probably it's not a new message, but but we tend to forget the long uh, periodicity that these uh, astronomic effects have on uh, on our planet in general and on the ocean. So when we talk about the sun, I'm referring to the thermodynamic effect of the um, it's not changing. We might just click on it. Uh, we're going to interest. Yeah. Come, come, Azima. Can you share the screen? So the thermodynamic uh, effect of the sun. Come, Azima. Can you share the screen? This is Malcolm. No, <laughs> I can't. With everybody but Malcolm. <laughs> Hi, Malcolm. Hi, Donaldo. I, I can see you, but I cannot see the screen. Hi. Well, I can see you, Malcolm. Oh, you're in the wrong place. Sure. And I remember the day of my uh, dissertation defense, Malcolm took us to his office. No, not that one. He popped up at Champagne and the bottle. The right down one. 
Also, yeah. Ah, it was so white, I didn't. <laughs> Are you here later this afternoon, Arnaldo? Say again. Are you here this afternoon? Right. <laughs> Bye, Malcolm. <laughs> 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 I mean, we're in the middle of the talk. <laughs> All right, as I, as I was saying, uh, when I talk about the sun, I refer to the solar activity that you see here, the record of solar activity for the last 770 years plus. And it has a, an apparent uh, well-defined cycle between 10 and 11 years. And this is caused by reversals in the solar, uh, as you see there, in, in the sun's magnetic field. And so there's been some recognition of the potential effects of, of this solar activity. Uh, I don't know if you've heard recently on the news, yesterday was supposed to be at a very high activity of the sun. But anyway, so it, it has this uh, day, day to day, but this also 10 to 11 year periodicity. Uh, it has been identified as uh, potential influence on the North Atlantic mean sea level pressure. And I'll talk about more effects later. This was uh, in, a, in a paper published in 77. And uh, also later on, more, more recently in 2015, uh, how this uh, solar activity influences the uh, Atlantic climate variability. Right? So that, that's uh, a potential relationship between solar activity and, and these uh, uh, climate variables. Also, there's been uh, some more work that has identified a uh, Pacific decadal precession in the uh, obviously North Pacific, um, in which uh, they identify for the lower tropospheric uh, pressure very uh, index an oscillation close to 10, 10 years that in some cases is uh, coincides with the Pacific decadal oscillation. So these are variations of in the climate uh, in the Pacific, in the North Pacific. And also the same uh, uh, group of authors identified what they call a slow, approximately 10 year precession of atmospheric pressures around the North Pacific, and which was also linked to this black line that represents the Northwest uh, precipitation. That is a precipitation in, in the Northwest, Northwestern part of the US. And when, when they decomposed this signal, the Northwest precipitation as a function of frequency or period, as you see there, they found a, a high variance in the period center at around 10, 11 years, so associated with the solar activity. They didn't discuss this too much, but they just talked about uh, this decadal precession. Uh, more recently, in 2021, uh, there was a, a paper that looked at see, uh, global average atmospheric temperatures, as you will see here in the very faint line, the gray line is the monthly uh, global air temperature throughout the, the last what, 100 and what is it, 40 years, 1880. And, and you see the uh, undisputable increasing trend, mostly after 1980, right? And you see the comparison also in, with the red, uh, orange, and blue lines uh, with, with the climate models. And also the annual mean, which is the black line, which is a smooth version of the gray line. And they try to decompose the relative influence of different factors in these variations. And uh, obviously after removing the trend, the trend, that uh, increasing trend, which is uh, uh, it's best illustrated by the smooth uh, orange and uh, blue line. You have some solar activity influence. It's a small influence. And then they have some influence from the from volcanic aerosols. Remember, these are influences on global mean temperatures. And then you have uh, the variability produced by the El Niño Southern Oscillation uh, Index represented there, which uh, explain most of the contribution to the variations, inter interannual variations of that um, 
air temperature, the global average air temperature. So the, this, this paper claimed that the, the influence of solar activity on these variations in air temperature in the planet are modest. Uh, so tending to relatively small. So in other words, they're, they're contesting that maybe we're placing too much emphasis on the influence of the solar activity uh, on the climate of the Earth. But, but uh, also on the other side of the argument, you have the, uh, this uh, group of researchers that indicate that increased ionization from solar activity supports the growth of aerosols into cloud condensation nuclei. So the, the fo uh, cloud formation might be influenced by, uh, by this solar activity that with a periodicity of 10 to 11 years, right? A couple of, of papers in which they demonstrate with laboratory experiments that this is a, this is a possibility, a mechanistic relationship between the solar activity and the cloud formation. And the, the main message of these two papers is, is that uh, atmospheric ionization modulates aerosol formation and growth, and ultimately affects the cloud formation and thereby temporarily affecting the radiative balance of Earth. So in other words, the, the temperatures on the Earth could be affected by the solar activity. Uh, so that's in terms of solar activity. Now, when we talk about the, the moon, we have these uh, long periods of the, of the orbit of the moon, as illustrated in this nice animation, in which I have to, to go uh, step by step. First, let, uh, these uh, green lines that radiate away from the equator of the Earth, let's call that the equatorial plane of the Earth. And uh, in red, that, uh, that would be the orbit of a satellite. It could be the moon. <laughs> around the Earth, and the yellow line is the, the equator of the Earth. So notice that the, the, the moon crosses the equator, the equatorial plane, uh, on, on this side that we're seeing and behind the Earth. So when it crosses it right there, that's called the ascending node, and on the other side would be the descending node. At the, at the beginning of this animation, that uh, red orbit was uh, coinciding at the position of that uh, red arrow, which is uh, pointing to a fixed star. And notice how the, the orbit of the, of the moon, uh, which takes around 27 days, actually 27.21 days to cross the equatorial plane, uh, presets it, that it moves around the equatorial plane. And it takes 18.6 years to go all the way around and come back to the same position as it, or initially in the red arrow. So that's a, a that's the, the nodal precession of the moon with a, a period of 18.6 years. And we call uh, the month, that is the period between uh, node, ascending node and ascending node, that's called the draconic month, with 27.21 days, draconic. And by the time that the moon comes back to the uh, to the position of the initial star, that's called the sidera, and it's a little longer, as you see this animation. Interestingly, that point, that eighteen point six uh, one year period, is the modulation between those two months. So if you do the difference in frequencies between one uh, twenty seven point one uh, to one that is period, that is one over twenty seven point one. And minus one over 27.32, the modulation between those two periods gives you the 18.61 year period. So in other words, okay, to the to the uh, bottom line is that every 18.6 year, year, the moon comes back to the same, the, the nodal position of the moon comes back to the same plane as uh, up pointing to a fixed star. So that's a period of 18.6 years that influences the gravitational forcing on Earth. So, so that's the same thing. Another precession, another long period of the orbit of the moon has to do with, uh, with the perigee. The perigee is the position of the moon closest to the Earth. And let's take that faint moon at the beginning, and it's pointing to a reference uh, star, let's say the vernal point. After one orbit, the moon, uh, and, and let's say that's that's full moon, right? 
So the full moon crosses first that reference point, and then it becomes full a little later. So the, the line that, that links the perigee, that is the point of closest uh, distance from the Earth to the, uh, from the moon to the Earth, um, and the apogee, which is the point of uh, greater distance, it's called the apsidal line. And that apsidal line rotates with every, uh, uh, with, with every lunar orbit. So the moon comes back to the reference star after 27.321 days, as, as I mentioned on the previous slide, that's called the sidereal month. But it comes back to being full again, uh, 27, sorry, not full, uh, to the perigee, the perigee after 27.55 days. So that's called the anomalistic month. All right, so this uh, absidal line continues to rotate around. And after 8.85 years, comes back to the same reference point or the, to the vernal point, uh, which is also the modulation between the sidereal month and the anomalistic month. Again, if you do the difference between those two periods, you get 8.85 years. And this is called the, the absidal precession. All right, so we have, we're collecting two precessions right now, the absidal precession, and the normal precession. A third, a third precession comes from the fact that uh, it has to do with the ascending node, as illustrated in this diagram, the ascending node and the perigee. If we take uh, that they're at the same point, they could be at the same point at the beginning. Since the anomalistic month related to the perigee is longer than the draconic month related to the uh, ascending node, it's a little longer. So this. The two start getting out of phase. The perigee is out of phase from the ascending node. And it takes six years for the perigee to coincide with the ascending node again. And this has to do with the two months that we have talked about, the anomalistic month and the draconic month. Again, the, the uh, modulation between those two gives you a period of six years. And that's called that. That precession is called the argument of the perigee. So in essence, I've collected three three precessions. That are, these are the, the three ones. If you didn't follow any of the astronomy that I described, it doesn't matter because what, what I want you to get out of that astronomy is that there are three precessions of the moon with three periods, long periods, 18.6 years, 8.85 years, six years. It is possible that any time series that we see on Earth is influenced by this, by these periods. So that, that's one of the things that I, I want to transmit today, to convey that we should look for these periods in whatever variable we're studying, if we have long enough time series. Right? This is nothing new, actually. Uh, and also I'm arguing that we should consider the periodicity of the solar activity between 20 and 11 years. So actually you have to go back to, to uh, um, your or our own Bob Curry, he was part of the Institute of Terrestrial and Planetary Atmospheres. Atmosphere. That back when it was that. Although when he wrote this paper, he was oh yeah, he, he, he had just left Stony Brook. And he talks about the, the contribution of both the uh nodal the, the nodal precession, which he calls lunisolar solar here, and the solar cycle on climate data. And uh, what he found, th this is a sort of a synthesis of 16 years of data, of, of, sorry, of 16 years of papers that he had published on the topic, looking at different parts of the earth. I'm surprised that we didn't hear much more about this. Uh, we haven't heard much more about this throughout our uh, studies of the ocean because uh, what he found, I mean, he synthesized this in, in, in his paper. When you decompose the variance of the temperature of in the United States at different stations in the United States, and he was able to compile 1,179 stations, he finds the periodicity of, of the north precession and the uh, periodicity of the uh, solar activity. That's in temperature, air temperature. Also in rainfall, the next one, in rainfall, he finds the same two uh, periodicities. 
in rainfall in South Africa. So this, this was rainfall in the US. But rainfall in South Africa, the third panel from left to right. You also identify those two periodicities. And finally, the last one in sea level, you find those two periodicities. He identified those two periodicities. Uh, in addition, he finds this in three rings data that he's, he was able to uh, gather. Those two periodicities, the lunar precession, the solar activity. And also in uh, an index of drought flood or uh, dry wet index in China, he finds those two. In fact, as I said, 16 years of, of, uh, of work on different aspects of these two periodicities. He finds these two periodicities in data of air temperature, rainfall, drought and flood indices up in China, of atmospheric pressure, of river flow, of crop yields, of livestock and poultry production, on fish catching, on dates of wine harvest, on volcanic eruptions, on cyclone occurrence, on thunderstorm occurrence, and on sea level. Right? So he is able to identify uh, these two periodicities. The variance of the signals explained is maybe 20 to 30% only, but that's only those two periodicities. Uh, as we go through through the through time in 2001, former colleagues at ODU looked at uh, North Pacific uh, coastal freshwater, and when they de decompose the signal of freshwater input to to the coast of Alaska, they find that peak in this in this spectrum of 18.61 years right? freshwater discharge. This is not inconsistent with what Curry found in other places. So when we go to tree ring uh, literature, dendrochronology, more recently in 2009, uh, they talk about the, the nodal period, 18.6 year periods, in uh, different records. As you see here, there's that 18.6 year period uh, emulating the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and also in another record of the same Pacific Decadal Oscillation, identifying this 18.6 year. What this author, Yasuda, didn't talk about is that the other peaks are 10, uh, close to 10, 11 year periods. Didn't mention them at all, but they, they seem to appear, at least in one of these spectrum, that uh, peak is uh, statistically significant. So they're there. We just don't pay much attention to them. And then in 2011, uh, an investigator from Scripps, Berger, uh, talked about another record of Pacific Decadal Oscillation derived from uh, dental chronology of records. And in, and in that case, he talks about other periods, right? There's the nodal period, the solar activity period, but there are also uh, the absolute precession. And they call this uh, actually Douglas, which is considered the, the parent, or not saying the father, the parent of uh, dendrochronology, um, identifies this as a, a daughter of the ten of the of the solar activity period. But Berger says no, it's it's the 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 other precession that I talked about, the argument of the fairy gene. And this 4.4 year period is a, a daughter of this, uh, the procession of the, of the absolute procession. So that's it for the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, as indicated by Berger. He also looked at, uh, at uh, a record of the El Nino, Southern Oscillation History, and he identified similar periodicity. So I guess what, what I extracted from all this literature is that we should pay attention not only to the solar activity and the normal precession, but there are also other periodicities related to these astronomic effects that we might consider. But before doing that, I, I uh, looked at, at the daily maximum of water level in Boston for the last 100 years, as you can see here, 100 years. This is uh, the maximum daily water level for Boston 
Yeah, the red line, the red line, yes. That, and that's why it seems a little noisy. The blue line is a one-year uh, filter that is a, after eliminating everything that has periods shorter than one year, you get the blue line. And when you get the best fit of only the normal precession, the 18.6 year, that you get the black line. So you can see that it, it's a very nice match explaining 73% of the variance. Only the nodal precession. Right? Obviously, you can do a little better than that if you add some of the other periodicities that I talked about, that I talked about, like nodal precession, solar cycle, and the argument of the very G. If you add that, you know, it starts resembling it a little bit more with 81% of the variance. Right? So that these are examples of uh, possible uh, variables for which this periodicities can uh, influence them, right? All right, so then what really got me into this uh, field is by looking at sea level. All these that I told you before, I had to go back and, and try to learn it, but because of studying sea level. And first I started in the East Coast of the US, but I'm not gonna go into that. Well, a little bit, of, a little bit. But these records that you see here come from the Gulf of Mexico. Those are the stations. Uh, interestingly, they stop at the U.S.-Mexican border. Okay. So yeah. And, and what I'll show you is a low pass filter um, water level that is uh, after I eliminate every seasonal variation and the trend and the long term trend. This is a, a phase diagram of both molar diagram of sea level variations in the Gulf of Mexico, going from the U.S.-Mexico border. All the way around the all, all, all around the Gulf of Mexico to uh, Key West, you see the, the stations that we have there. Uh, the horizontal lines that you see on this diagram is the data coverage. So everything else is interpolated on, on the horizontal line that we have a hundred years of data. So everything, every time you see red here, it means a uh, anomalously high water level, blue anomalously low water level. So what we do is. Uh, generate an, an index of all these records. And the index of all those records is the principal component of all those records uh, illustrated by the blue line here uh, with year-to-year -year variability. And then I generated a smooth version of that year-to-year -year variability uh, representing a five-year uh, smooth version of it that's the Gulf of Mexico sea level oscillation that I've called, and which represents all, that blue line and red line in the upper panel really represent all the data that are illustrated in the lower line. So we can uh, synthesize them in one line. And when I fit uh, several of the, actually all of the precessions in the lunar activity period, sorry, solar activity period that I mentioned before, plus some of their interactions, there are 10, 10 periods that I uh, list here. I can explain 93% of the variance of the water level variability in the Gulf of Mexico. That's with uh, with those 10 harmonics. And uh, you can say, well, yeah, that, that's nice, but it could happen with a random time series, right? So I tried random time series. I generated a random time series, blue line of 100 years, 120 years. That's the blue line. And then smooth it to five years, as I did with the others. So that's the red line. And then uh, try to fit the same harmonics to the red line. And you can see that the, the uh, match is not that good. Uh, and then I do it for another time series. And again, the match is not that good. And they said, well, it's two, two realizations, right? And that explains less than 50% of the variance. So then I said, okay, so this is only two realizations, two random time series. I'm going to do 100,000 time series. And when I do 100 random, 100,000 random time series and do the same procedure, smooth them to five years and fit the same 10 harmonics, this is the distribution I get. And with, uh, in the horizontal axis, I have the variance explained by the fit. And you can see very rarely I can explain 93% uh, of, the, of the variance or, or better. Actually, 
in less than 1% of the, of the time, I can explain with a random time series, I can explain uh, such a, so much of the variance in a random time series. So th th there's probably a, a, a physical link that we haven't been able to sort out between this forcing, astronomic forcing, and the variability of sea level. And when you look at the, the sea level variability in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the blue line here, it's very similar to what happens in, in the entire eastern coast of the US, which is uh, represented by, by the, uh, what color is that, fuchsia? Maybe not, I'd like to say fuchsia, that's why. <laughs> and then uh, the red line is only for the southeastern US. And for all those three, uh, three representations, again, these are principal components for all those regions. The lunar and solar inter interactions can explain more than 90% of the variance of the sea level in the eastern US. So we are actually venturing after 2020, we're venturing a forecast of what might happen for the rest of the century in terms of sea level variability. Remember, this is on top of the trend. So we're not considering the trend here, which is approximately uh, three and a half millimeters per year. That's on top of that, you might have these, these oscillations for the for the rest of the century with a hot spot, hot moments being uh, later on in the second half of this set of this decade and so on. So we'll see. You can place your bets and see whether this will work or not. I I hope we're all alive here to come back and, and see whether this works. Uh, I tried the same analysis for uh, water levels in, in, in Venice because they have a nice long time series. And it explains uh, at least uh, close to 80% of the variance in Venice, of the sea level in, in Venice. We also ventured a forecast. We're gonna show it to you. But the next important question is that, can this astronomic forcing explain an important variance of the, of the ENSO? And just to remind us what ENSO is, the El Niño Southern Oscillation, it's an anom anomaly in Sea surface temperature in the tropical Pacific, as you should, as you see here. Um, these are anomalies of sea surface temperature that you see animated between 1998 and 1999. And those anomalies, as you will know, can be contained in in an index, which is the ENSO index. Whenever it's positive, is El Niño, and where whenever it's this index is neg negative in La Nina. So here you see uh, the periods when you have had strong El Niños and strong La Nina. And this, the typical periodicity that has been attributed to this uh, index is two to, two to 10 years, two to seven or two to 10. And it's been uh, um, attributed mostly to the internal variability of the ocean atmospheric system. So there's no consideration of potential astronomic effects from the variability of El Niño. So that's what I'm trying to explore here. But before exploring that, I wanted to show you a video of ENSO so, so that we're on the same page, right? Oh, God. are they going to be able to see this? Huh? We have to reshare it. Let's reshare it. Reshare it? We'll share <laughs> Hi, Mark. No, I, they don't want to share you. Where's the share? <laughs> Down there at the bottom. Six shares. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, like, that big purple one in the corner. Lower right corner. <laughs> well, I'll try this because this is what I wanted to show. So, this is the colleagues here in Colombia helped me illustrate the ENSO index. <laughs> La Niña. Can you hear? Yeah. El Niño. They're saying El Niño. La Niña. <laughs> There's Martin Visbeck uh, there, climate scientist. Doing El Niño y La Niña, I, I, I didn't believe that he was going to do that. But well, you only see this in Colombia. <laughs> I don't know if you can, if you would experience this in Tanzania. No. I don't think I'm from Mexico, and I don't think we would experience this in Mexico. Is that everybody would join doing the the answer shuffle. <laughs> anyway, so that 
Let's stop sharing this slide. <laughs> okay, so you need to share your PowerPoint one more time. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. Sorry. So, Camasima promised that he was going to do the end. Oh, yeah. Right now, but I don't see him doing it. <laughs> He's going to do it after long. the show. Yeah. Okay, great. Right, so. So there have been some attempts to actually relate to to relate the solar activity, which is the black line that you see here, and the uh, the uh, and so index, which appears as the uh, red and blue, right? The and then you so what they're trying to do in this uh, paper, they actually uh, published the paper in twenty thirty one that suggests that. Right after the drop of uh, solar activity uh, index, you get an El Nino. Okay? It does more or less happen, but it's sort of a, I would say that it's a wishy washy because this is not going to be the only effect that, that causes the variability of El Nino. They argue that, okay, so we need to look at the solar activity because right after the drop of the solar activity, we're going to see El Nino. Okay. okay, well, it might work, but. Not all the time, but let's consider the other effects, right? The the, uh, the lunar effects. So what I do is I took the Enso index, which is the red line here, uh, every month. the The blue line is the one year uh, filtered version of, of that red line, and then I I work with a three year filter, which is the uh, grayish that you see there, and the black one. The black one is five. Five year filter for ENSO for the ENSO index. So again, I fitted the, the same 10 uh, harmonics. And for the three year filter, uh, we we're able to reproduce the 66% of the variance of ENSO with a three year low pass filter. With a five year low pass filter, we explain 86% of the variance with those 10 harmonics that I, I mentioned before. And again, I did the uh, the 100,000 uh, realizations of random signals for the three year low pass filter. Uh, th this is the distribution of the 100,000 uh, realizations, which indicates that the probability that it, this uh, random signal is less than 2%. And then for the five year low pass filter, uh, this is the distribution of the 100,000 realizations which the approximately 1% probability that it's a random signal, right? So this sort of gives us some confidence that we need to look at the mechanistic relationship between the sun, the moon, and, and the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, sort of physically, it might make, make sense because both the moon and the sun affect atmospheric pressure, or, or seem to affect air, air temperature, seem to affect atmospheric pressure seem to affect cloudiness, seem to affect many other uh, variables, right? How that happens, we don't know yet, but it's possible that there's a, a mechanistic link. The, the third and final example, so I've, I've showed you, uh, we worked on sea level on El Nino, and the third and final example would be on, on salinity intrusion in an estuary in Southwest Florida. So this is in Charlotte Harbor that you see there, uh, nice Florida, beautiful, uh, well, it was beautiful, Florida. It's changing quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so, in in one of the tributaries to a large estuary, Charlotte Harbor, we deployed some salinity sensors along the estuary, as you see there, represented by the field circles. Uh, a total of, I think, eight or seven stations. And for that, we are able to construct a phase diagram or top molar diagram, in which in the horizontal, Axis. Actually, we didn't do this. It was a water authority that withdraws water from the river. And these are 11 years of data. It's a short period, right? But it's a long period for salinity measurements. So these are very challenging measurements, as you will know, because of the conductivity cell that goes back. So in this uh, phase diagram, we have in the vertical axis distance from the entrance to the estuary, so from here, going up the, the estuary. 
and we have 11 years in the horizontal direction. And, and as you see here, a very nice rhythmicity, seasonal variation of the salt water intruding into the, the basin, as you can get probably the, the dry periods are associated with intrusion of salty water. And to, during the wet periods, it's all blue, meaning that the salt is pushed out of the, of the basin. So again, doing a decomposition of all these records into one index, this would be the uh, principal component mode one, which shows a beautiful seasonal variation, but interannual variability in the seasonal signal. When we fit some of the uh, astronomic effects to this signal, we get that the orange line. And we're able to explain 60% uh, explain of the variance of the salinity intrusion. So it is possible that uh, salinity intrusion may be influenced by, by these periodicities that I'm, I've been talking about. We know that river discharge, well, we know it, it seems that river discharge is influenced by the nodal precession. So it's, if, if the river discharge indeed is influenced by nodal precession, then salinity intrusion would also be influenced by lunar precession. We don't have a, a long enough period here to, to determine one uh, lunar precession period, but but at least we we start we we are still uh, we sorry we're st uh, starting to think about that possibility, and uh, so that that somewhat uh, explains each one of the periodicities of the variant. Uh, so you can see that the one that explains most of the variance is one uh, the, the annual cycle as expected. Right? So in summary, I talked about uh, I come back to the, the main message, which is we should uh, think about astronomic influences on any variable that we study, because we can de detect it on the inter interdecadal variations of sea level. We can also detect it on, on a linear southern oscillation, and we can detect it on uh, variations of salinity, uh, salinity and salt water intrusion into estuary. So again, let's keep thinking about the sun. With that, I talk to you. With so, I mean, maybe it's perhaps not very surprising that the heat has an influence on sea level. I mean, I I always thought that these long period. Um, Lunar cycles were part of the regular tidal prediction forecast thing. So th that's already baked into what the sea level is supposed to be. Are these anomalies relative to that? Or? No, they're included there. Okay. But that, the thing is that that's not the only. Right. So the, the additional bit is the solar cycle that, that is added, which is explaining. So do you, I guess the question is if you just use the long period lunar cycles, um, how much variance do you explain relative to using both the long period lunar cycles and the solar cycle? No, I, I did that for uh, for Venice, and I don't remember the numbers, but so it, it is. Uh, I remember that it was important to include all of them. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, they, some of them have more or less influence, but but it's important to include all of them. Does anyone have a a, uh, a hypothesis for how the the solar cycle would influence sea? I'm sorry, say again. Does anyone have a hypothesis for how the solar cycle would influence sea level? Other than just making it warmer? Right. right. Maybe that's well, it, it, is, <laughs> it is that. And it, there's also the since the the solar cycle, the, the solar activity can well indeed influences the radiation of the atmosphere. So that influences atmospheric pressure and it influences air temperature. It should influence winds, right? I haven't seen any anything on wind. And the wind will redistribute the mass of the ocean. So that, that's a possible linkage. Yeah. And the inverse barometric effect. The inverse barometric effect. Yeah, yeah. Right, but uh, I think that uh, recent studies on, on the main cause of sea level variations, what I've seen, right, is that the wind is the main cause, uh, cause for the interannual variation in sea level. Um, in this slide where you have uh, predictions for the next for the rest of the century, 
Um, did that include uh, predicted sea level rise or no? No, that that would be without considering the the trend that that will change with time. So that's on top of the trend. Okay. No, salinity prediction or fit. How many harmonics were in that fit? Five, I think. Only five? Five. Yeah, so it's right here. One, two, three, four, six. Right. So uh, half, a, half a year, one year, three years, six years, eight, four, eight, 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 eight. Plus more than three, the six. Well, by the first. So, Sorry, Bob. So some of the things that you were talking about are directly coupled to the astronomical driving forces. And some of them are indirect, like uh, the river flow, for instance, in areas that I'm familiar with that are affected by and so patterns of river flows are coupled directly to the precipitation patterns that move in and out of an area as ENSO right. um, oscillates. And so um, which of that long list of things that you that you put that are correlated are primary drivers and which are sort of coupled into those factors? Uh, you see what my question yeah, is? Yeah, I think uh, let's see if, if my answer is sort of is uh, related to your question. <laughs> uh, I think that what I would say, and this this would be confirmed by currently, is that the main drivers are the sun and the moon. Okay. And so that that's my main argument. How that happens, I don't know. I am. It's a very complex connection. But I mean, you can think that again. What I said about the solar activity, right? More solar activity, more radiation on the atmosphere, uh, different cloud formation, different precipitation, different air temperature, different uh, atmospheric pressure, winds, and, and that becomes that trickles out to the uh, air temperature. I mean, sorry, sea surface temperature, and. Uh, and redistribution of mass so with respect to the river as well, how would the cloud formation and precipitation be affected? But there are two independent uh, explorations of this by Curry and by Tom Royer uh, that there's a, uh, at least looking at, at the signals, they identify these nodal things. So how that happened, that's a, that's a big challenge, I think. I think Malcolm had a question. Malcolm, did you have a question? <laughs> he raised his hands and then it disappeared. No, you're still, you're still. You're muted. Still muted. I know that typically, typically you're not shy. But... <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh no, uh, Bob. It was really the question that Bob just asked, and uh, but I'd like to come and see you this afternoon. I didn't realize you were here in person. I I, I can you can't hear you a little bit louder. Put your yes, microphone in front of you. Yes, mouth. I I didn't realize you were here in person, so I would like to come and see you this afternoon sometime. He wants to visit you. This he wants to come here. Did you have a question too, Malcolm? <laughs> No, Bob, Bob asked the same question. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I have a question. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks, Michael. Students. Uh, okay. if, if students have no questions, I have a question. I also had one quick question. Uh, okay, well, we have time for both. Go ahead. <laughs> so, Just to get back to what Chris asked, how many of the lunar periodicities you see that you wouldn't get if you just ran T-tide. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. If you run T-tide, I don't know if you get the six-year position. I don't know if you if you think I'll see the same point. Yeah. yeah. It does include the nodal correction. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I think you if you have a long enough record, you ought to get it. Get a lot of it with T tide. Right. Okay. And, and but but I guess that uh my contention here is that we should consider the interactions of these periodicities, not only the, the 
as you get them from from, so, a, from the analysis for how they they may interact among themselves and also with the solar activity. So uh, I'm thinking one of the of the processes you listed was volcanic eruptions. That was very That's strange. What the, those that, that I listed are for, based on Curry's work. Oh, we need to have a head check. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so I'm thinking if, if there is a signal there, in fact, maybe that might help us because the way the solid earth is going to behave and the way the mm. fluid air right. and the water is going to behave is going to be different. And I wonder if anybody has kind of looked at all those and they see if there is any shift or any differences. That would help us to in down the process. Yeah. I mean, if, if that was the case also, there might be some linkage to the earthquake. But uh, yeah, so. Because with volcanic eruption, it's really, I can't, I know there's solid earth tides, but it's yeah, really and, stretched. And you do have, uh, maybe it's a, uh, uh, in that particular case, it's a chicken and egg thing, because we know that volcanic eruptions do affect cloud formation. Right, right. right. Precipitation. So, it can be so, right. Sources. so it, it, that, in that case, that might be a, like, correlation doesn't mean causation. Could be, most probably. All right, before it gets too wild here. <laughs> it's starting to get fun. <laughs> we'll continue at lunch, I think. So are there any other questions? Then join us for lunch in the sponsor's room. Thank you. And hopefully don't. <laughs>